Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Aleksander Wojtowicz, and I'm going to talk about my experience with developing an open source ultra wide bind real time locating system uh, with Zephyr. So I'll start off with a few words about me. Uh, I'm a recent graduate of computer science at AGH USD in Krakow and a software engineer at AV System for nearly two years. So AV System specializes in a couple of fields, including IoT device management, where we provide solutions based on, based on lightweight machine to machine protocol. And I myself work on Anjay, a C platform agnostic implementation of lightweight end to end client, and also parts of that I varied many uh, SDKs, RDOSs, whatever including Zephyr. Uh, as for my experience with Zephyr, it also has started IV, at AV System. So I didn't even know about Zephyr, uh, that Zephyr exists before joining the company as an intern. And at the same time, it was also the very first, the very first thing I have worked on there. Uh, and my first experience was really good. Uh, and from day one, I really enjoyed using Zephyr. And also from that moment, I use it in pretty much all of my embedded or IoT projects after hours including the one I will be talking about today. So what's the plan for the talk? Uh, I will give you a short introduction into real-time locating systems and what they are used for. Then I'll talk about what's ultra-wideband and how you can use UWB to build highly accurate RTLSs. Uh, after that, I will finally introduce the actual project uh, I have worked on and also the motivation for it. Uh, and then I will talk about the implementation and my experience uh, with using Zephyr uh, for this project. More specifically, I would uh, like to talk about how Zephyr has helped me with developing the solution quickly, and which is quite generic and hardware independent. Uh, I will also tell you about some things that didn't work so well, and I will share you many tips and observations from my point of view, that is from a fairly new user. So let's start with a generic, uh, let's start with a general introduction into real-time locating systems and ultra wideband. So generally speaking, uh, RTLSs are used to uh, track locations of some assets like vehicles, tools, or workforce in real time. And it's usually assumed that uh, the location data needs to be sent to some central server. Also, when we talk about real time lo locating systems, uh, we usually mean indoor settings like warehouses or manufacturing plants. So for example, GPS trackers simply are immediately out of discussion because they just don't work there, right? Uh, to make things clear, I start with a real, real life example. Uh, so in McDonald's in Poland and probably many other countries, there's optional table service. And one way to order food to your table is to actually uh, go to a kiosk where you pick up one of these stand shaped devices. Then you enter its number and you bring the device to your table. Now these things have a secret. Uh, there are also a locator which uses, a Bluetooth, which uses Bluetooth to find its location. Thanks to that, uh, staff doesn't have to look for you all across the venue. So how do they work? Uh, there's many options, but usually it's like this. Uh, there's a couple of static devices called anchors. And the tent like device, which I will call a tag, uh, measures the strength of the signal coming from these anchors or vice versa. Now, because we know where exactly uh, the anchors are set up, and we know the signal strength measured by the tag to each of, uh, of them, we can calculate the approximate location. The same principle can, you, of using signal strength to locate things can be used with any other wireless technology, like Wi-Fi, for example. In general, these systems are pretty uh, cheap to make and easy to build, and also they work in indoor settings as opposed to GPS trackers. The accuracy, uh, at least with Bluetooth, is, at, is up to one meter, which is like, pretty good for some use cases. But there's also a few problems. First, the measured signal strength is affected not only by the distance between the devices, but also by possible signal reflections, attenuation, etc. Uh, and these systems uh, seem to behave quite poorly in non-line-of-sight non uh, situations where there's some kind of obstruction between those two devices. This obviously negatively affects the accuracy of the system. Secondly, uh, there's, mono, there's also many use cases when that maximum one meter accuracy isn't just enough. So what else can we use? Say hello to Ultra Wideband. It's a wireless communication technology that has been around for a few years. Uh, and recently, it started to become more and more popular, also in consumer electronics. Uh, for instance, all iPhones since the 11 have a UWB chip. It's also a part of 802.15.4 now. Uh, it's one of many files defined in the spec. 
and what sets you, you, what sets you that will be apart from other radar technologies uh, are its distinctive uh, physical properties that enable precise distance measurements uh, even in situations where there is no direct line of sight. And this makes you that will be ideal for constructing highly accurate really time locating systems. So this distance measurement capability is already being used in some widely available products. Uh, one example is Ap Apple AirTag. It's a tracker which you can attach to your personal belongings and ultra wideband there is used to find the exact distance between your phone and the last item. And another example is BMW Digital Key Plus, which is an app that turns your smartphone into a keyless entry system. And the best thing about that is that actually it's immune to relay attacks because uh, it measures the actual distance between the car and your phone, which makes, makes it much safer. So how does this work? Well, generally speaking, UWB works on very high frequencies between 3 to 10 gigahertz, and it communicates with short message, message bursts occupying at least 500 megahertz of bandwidth, which is a lot compared to other radios. Because these pulses are so short, two nanoseconds or less actually, we can measure the reception time uh, with high accuracy, and we are also able to detect reflected signals much easier. From that, we can calculate the time of flight of a message, which multiplied by speed of light uh, gives us the distance between two devices. And from sever several distance measurements uh, to anchors, we can uh, calculate the position. So the simplest distance measurement method called single-sided two-way ranging is the following. The initiator sends a message to the responder recording transmission time. Then the responder receives the message and after a particular delay sends the response. Then the initiator uh, receives the response and records reception time. The difference between TX and RX times uh, on initiator is round trip time. From that, we subtract responder's delay, divide it by two, and we get the time of flight. And finally, that time of flight gets multiplied by speed of flight, giving us the distance. So in practice, uh, with this method and some additional magic sauce that happens underneath, like clock drift correction and so on, uh, we get about 20 centimeters, centimeters of accuracy but with additional processing and antenna calibration, it can be increased even to two centimeters. So how do we get from this distance measurements to position? Uh, the process is called true range multilateration. There's actually many algorithms, but I will explain just the common principle. I'm also showing the 2D case here to make things much simpler. So by measuring the distance to an anchor, uh, we know that the tag is located somewhere on the circle around the anchor, and the circle's radius is equal to that distance. Uh, by adding another measurement, we can see that the circles intersect, giving us two possible solutions. So we add one more measurement, and now we know where the tag is located. For the three-dimensional case, it's a little bit more complicated, because you are not intersecting spheres, uh, so you are interse intersecting spheres instead of circles. And as you can see, the three measurements do not give you the unique solution yet, so you need to have at least four anchors. Since UWB-based RTLSs have such a great accuracy, uh, they not only improve the usual use cases of RTL systems I discussed earlier, but also enable some new ones. For instance, such a system could be used for prevention of accidents. Imagine a system where the workforce and the heavy machines are monitored, and then if anyone comes close to that heavy machine while it, it is operating, it triggers some kind of alarm. It also en enables various cases, various cases of asset tracking in factories or warehouses. Thanks to that, it's possible to find these assets much quicker uh, if they are needed. And also by tracking historical usage uh, of and move patterns of these assets, you could optimize the way they are used and placed around the site. And there's one also I came up with. Uh, think of smart shopping carts with a navigation system which could scan your shopping list and navigate you through the shortest path around the store to grab all the things you need. At first I thought it was, at first I thought about it more uh, as of a joke. Uh, but then I realized that this could be actually useful. Just please don't patent it because maybe I'll try to make uh, one someday. Okay, uh, so we're done with the introduction to the topic. So I think I can finally show on what I've been working for some time. So the project is called Hyper RTLS. It's an open source UW based RTLS uh, system I, that I have actually co developed with my friend, Sebastian Szczepanski, uh, for our engineering thesis at HUHUSD. At this point, I would also like to thank Sebastian for his collaboration and idea for the system, and Professor Tomasz Szydło for the supervision. So the whole project is hosted on GitHub, and in case you are interested, you will not only find the application sources there, but there's also the full text of our thesis. 
So the solution consists of two major parts, which are a set of Zephyr-based apps, which I wrote for tags and anchors. And these apps target by default DecoF MDK 101 DevKit, I think the most popular UWB DevKit on the market. And that DevKit runs on the NRF52 and UWB module. And thanks to Zephyr, uh, these apps actually have no direct dependencies on this exact board. So they are easily portable to any other target that has BLE and DW1000 chip uh, connected. Additionally, uh, there's also a gateway app requ requiring BLE radio and some IP stack, but I will tell you more uh, about that later. The other part is the backend software developed by Sebastian, which includes a Node.js app uh, and with a Postgres database and Mosquito MQTT broker. Uh, and this app serves a REST API that is used for managing individual RTLS systems and for retrieving the location data. And that REST API is supposed to be used by external applications that run business logic of some potential end product. Additionally, there's also an example app uh, using that API, which I, will, which I will show you shortly. So this is the general data flow slash architecture. Uh, the location data transport is transported from tags over BLE to the gateway, which communicates with a broker over MQTT, which then talks to the app that exposes a REST, P REST API for potential, potential external services. So what was our motivation for the project? Well, frankly speaking, we needed to do something for our, for our engineering physics, right? That's the reason number one. But then we chose this problem because apparently there's pretty much no open source systems like this, which is definitely a gap in the market since there's plenty of companies which actually started that system for a lot of money. What's, more, what's worse, they aren't cheap, which makes the technology inaccessible for makers and hobbies while the hardware itself for these kinds of systems is rather inexpensive. We are talking about 25 bucks that's for a device that's ready to go. What's more, uh, the dev kits come with a library that can be used to implement an RTLS, but apparently it's distributed as a blob, which is a huge shame because it makes it pretty much useless for learning purposes. So before we get into the next part, uh, I'd like to present a quick recording of the example app. So on the video, we will see uh, the view from the camera and the app. The app has a 3D model of the room where I set up the system. On the view, there's also dots representing the tag and anchors. So the tag is red and the anchors are blue. Uh, I know that I look quite funny walking with the thing on top of my head. Uh, but anyways, uh, you can see that the system is able to catch even the slightest movement in all three dimensions. And if you compare that to what you see on the camera, you can say that it works pretty nicely. Now, uh, let's finally talk about the implementation and neat features of Zephyr that allowed me to get this project working quite fast. So let's talk first about the gateway. Uh, one of the problems we had to solve was getting the location data from the tags to the MQTT broker. And since there is no IP stack on the board we used, we needed to find a different way. So we figured that since every pair of knee boring anchors is always in proximity, uh, due to the way you need to place them to make UWB ranging work, it makes perfect sense to use some kind of mesh networking for that, uh, where the anchors would be used as the backbone made of relays. Open thread would be probably the best option uh, since we would be able to talk to the MQTT broker directly, uh, but the SOC we used didn't support that, so we went with Bluetooth mesh. We obviously can't communicate uh, with the broker directly using Bluetooth mesh, right? So hence the need for the gateway uh, that would translate messages from Bluetooth to MQTT and vice versa. So how did we make the gateway? At first, I didn't think even about using Zephyr for that. The idea was to use some kind of Linux single, of Linux single board computer, like Raspberry Pi, which has bo both Wi-Fi and BLE, and we write some app that would communicate with Bluetooth mesh using uh, Dbus calls to Bluesy. Uh, it was a neat idea because uh, it would be ab we would be able to run the script also on our development PCs, but frankly speaking, Either I couldn't find good materials, or both Dbus and Bluesy APIs are very complex, especially for a newcomer. So, and what's worse, the wrappers around that, for example, for Python, were also poorly documented. So I tried to find some options around Zephyr instead. Uh, the big plus is that we would use the same Bluetooth API as on tags and anchors, but let's be honest. Since we need to bring additional hardware, uh, instead of just running the app on development PC, the development which be, will be much co more complicated simply to just cracking some Python script. Or want it. Uh, I didn't want to give up on not having to bring any additional hardware, at least for the development, so I, exp I explored emulators in Zephyr, 
and it turned out that we can still get away with no additional devices. So Zephyr, as probably you know, uh, has many virtual targets, uh, including QEMU, which gives the closest experience to running code on a real board, or native POSIX, which compiles your Zephyr app into a Linux exec executable. And native POSIX is certainly much lighter to run compared to a full-blown virtual machine, but it has some strange limitations, like you can't use blocking loops, so you need to watch out. The docs are pretty good on that topic. Uh, at first, emulators doesn't sound useful, because emulators are supposed to emulate things, right? We use them for testing and so on. But it turns out that you can proxy real peripherals to them and make code interact with the outside world. So, so we went with QEMU. So how do we add internet connectivity uh, to Zephyr on QEMU? Pretty much options are about uh, first setting up a TAN or TAP interface, so basically a virtual network interface, either on layer two or layer three, and then somehow forwarding that interface into the emulator. So for instance, you can use serial line internet protocol, which is forwarded to QEMU uh, by opening a Unix socket on the host side, which becomes a serial device uh, in the guest, or we can make QEMU virtualize an Intel gigabit adapter over TAP interface, which is the preferred way for the target. In practice, this is quite easy. All you need to do is to set up a couple of options in Kankawafink, uh, enable the Intel Gigabit driver, and configure the network. Then you need to run a net setup HA script, which is provided in NetTools repository of Zephyr. Actually, there's a bunch of various scripts for IP forwarding for a zillion of configurations. And after that, you also need to configure the NAT, uh, which is a couple of additional commands, uh, and also there's a script in our repo for this. As you can see uh, in this example, we are routing the traffic to the Wi-Fi adapter of the host. Unfortunately, uh, at first I had some issues with getting everything to work properly. For some reason, only on QEMU, for the first couple of seconds after starting the app, communication just didn't work, so the MQTT client wasn't able to do the DNS query. Thankfully, with KConfig, uh, you can detect on which board you are running on, so you can solve issues with specific targets like this. Well, that's one way of dealing with problems. I'm not proud of it, but at the moment it works, so I just didn't care. Uh, setting up a separate interface has also a cool side effect. You can use Wireshark and capture the packets from the whole interface without uh, any other communication on your PC interfering, which is a big win in terms of debugging. It's also quite convenient to write the networking code there. You can first write and test your code on an emulator like QEMU, and only then, if you're sure it works fine, you can port it to the target hardware. So we've dealt with one part, the internet connection, but we need to get the BLE to work in QEMU2. So as you know, uh, root flow energy is split into two layers, uh, host and controller, and eventually there are some layers on top of that, uh, like Bluetooth mesh. So host and mesh implementations are just pure software, and we include them into the application. The controller, though, uh, is completely separate, and it's linked to the host using the HCI protocol, or host controller interface, and that controller can be located either on the same chip as the application, so that's the case for most BLE SOCs like the NRF52, or it can be moved to another controller. For instance, on the NRF9160 DK, the host lives on the NRF91, while the controller is on external chip and these are connected using UART. Now, for our needs, we also needed uh, a similar configuration, but just a little bit more complicated. Uh, so we are using the controller that's located on the host PC that we are running the gateway on, so that's probably the Intel's Bluetooth adapter or whatever your PC is using. And then we use a tool called BT Proxy, which forwards a Linux Bluetooth socket into a Unix socket, uh, which then is forwarded to QEMU as a serial device. In practice, well, uh, there's no KConfig options to show you because Zephyr is apparently smart enough to en enable all the necessary Bluetooth options when you choose QEMU. As for the run command, just to make sure, first, first let's list out all of the HCIs in the system with HCI config, but probably you are going to see only one, HCI, HCI zero. Uh, then you need to shut it down, actually, because Bluezy is running a host layer, which uses the controller so you can connect all the Bluetooth peripherals uh, to your computer. Uh, by the way, make sure that you don't, don't have anything connected. I was dumb enough to call that comment when I had my headphones connected to the computer, so you need to watch out. And then uh, you need to run BT proxy, which forwards the controller to a Unix socket, which then is converted to a serial device on the side of the guest. And the hardest part here is probably compiling BT proxy because it's not just distributed as a package, at least on Ubuntu. 
And that's it. Uh, text to just, I would say, insane flexibility of Zephyr. You can build a functional app with Bluetooth and network connection that runs directly on the PC. Uh, so in case of our system, the gateway was like the very same laptop I'm presenting on today. Is it lightweight? No. It runs on the damn QEMU, right? Uh, the app takes about like 50 megabytes of RAM. But at least, at least it was pretty much issue free, besides one small problem. As a side note, before we jump uh, into other parts of the system, I had a difficulty with finding proper sample code for making a Bluetooth, uh, for, for making a custom Bluetooth uh, mesh model. But thankfully, I found one in NRF Connect SDK. So NCS is a fork of Zephyr uh, for Nordic semi products, and for most, IP and most APIs are compatible, which means that the most called samples and documentation also applies to upstream Zephyr, which we used. It wasn't so straightforward because there were some macros we used which are, were not present in upstream Zephyr, but I just inlined them, uh, and it, everything seemed to work. So the takeaway is if you look for some documentation or samples, especially around Bluetooth in Zephyr, NCS docs are worth checking out, or if you are using Nordic products, then probably you can just switch uh, completely to NCS. Okay, so we are done with the gateway. Now let's talk about getting the ultra wideband module to work. It's actually a quite embarrassing story. So Zephyr has a 802.15.4 subsystem, and there's also a driver for DW1000, but I didn't use it. Why? Well, at first, it occurred to me that you can't use that API for retrieving the timing data, which is crucial for implementing uh, that uh, range algorithm. Uh, so instead, I, I partially ported the original driver for STM32. Later, after doing all of that porting work and experimenting with the samples, when I finally learned that the registers are used for the control of TX and RX times, I finally understood the Zephyr driver and realized that it's possible to do everything I needed. So the net PKT interface is quite flexible uh, and allows for configuration of many different parameters, but the functions for that are optional and you have to enable them in kconfig. So the takeaway is if you provide a complex interface with many layers of abstraction, it's quite hard to use them without you know, any concrete examples. Anyways, it was for me too late to change the implementation, so let's talk about my custom driver port. So the porting process actually went quite smoothly, considering that I don't have much experience with writing code that interfaces directly with the hardware. I think that DecaWave has done a quite good job on separating the platform-specific stuff, although the interfaces could be probably named better. Like write to SPI or underscore sleep are probably not good candidates for globally exported symbols. As you can see, the primary difference between the original STM32 code and Zephyr implementation is that you make only a single call to the SPI API. And the API accepts a set of RX or TX buffers, and it also automatically handles the chip select pin that you configure in device tree, which is quite convenient. One warning, though, on some platforms like STM32, you can configure automatic hardware con control of chip select pin instead of dedicating a GPIO that is controlled by the software. So before you try uh, to configure any SPI peripherals in device tree, make sure that the chip select control is in sync with what you configure in kconfig. One time when I was writing a driver for a, for a NFC module, I wasted a lot of time hunting down this problem. Speaking of device tree, um, I think we all have been there you try to change a one small thing there and you end up reading the docs in the Linux kernel for the fifth hour to understand how it works. And because in Zephyr the device configuration is translated into a million of C macros that you later use in the code, it makes debugging it even harder. Obviously, it, that's the price we pay, right, for subarp experience with, for example, the sensor API, where you say that you, have, you need some kind of value from a sensor at a specific node and it works like magic if you finally get the configuration right. So I had two things that can make your experience, well, not good because it will never be good, but at least less painful. The first one, if you are, if you are using VS Code, uh, is to use NRF Connect for VS Code extension pack. So what's little known is that this extension pack uh, works not just with NCS, but with upstream Zephyr and other Zephyr-based SDKs just fine. So the device the language support there can make your experience much, much better. You won't have to go through Zephyr's sources anymore to understand where the definitions come from. Secondly, I'd like to recommend Marty Bolivar Stark from last year's Zephyr Developer Summit. He explains there the inner workings of device tree, and you will also learn how to try to decode the cryptic errors that compilers generate when something is not right. 
and you will also learn the so-called macrobatics that are used there. Okay, so we're done with setting up the connectivity and peripherals. So now I would like to tell you about something about doing maths on embedded devices. So as I have said earlier, the text measure the distances to anchors and then from that we calculate the location. There are two ways you can go with. So the first one is to send all of these measurements uh, to the server, calculate the location, and then if it's needed, uh, send it back to the tag. Or you can calculate the location on the tag and then optionally send it to the server. So we went first with computing the location on the tags because it has some huge advantages. First, you can have a very high refresh rate locally. For instance, to be able to implement a very responsive navigation system, which only periodically would send some, send some results to the central server. And secondly, it's quite a lot of traffic to send all individual measurements and retrieve the, the results back. So basically, it's a de decision of scalability, right? So the problem is that we need to implement the multilateration algorithm to run on these tags. Obviously, implementing it all from ground up is not an option. I'm not showing the algorithm here. You will find it in the full thesis. But the key thing is that it involves co the computation of a matrix pseudo inverse, which is a complex algorithm. On full-size computers, there's plenty of options. Uh, so you can use NumPy for Python or GNU Scientific Library for C. And at first, I thought that maybe I would be able to compile GSL for Zephyr, but the library is just so huge that it surely won't fit on a one megabyte flash. Thankfully, Zephyr has a dedicated linear algebra library called Zephyr Scientific Library. Just for some reason, though, it's not called GSL, it's GSILib. Uh, what's nice? What's nice is that the API is actually quite similar to GSL, I think, so if you have any experience with that, you will be able to start using it quickly. What's even better is that it's very easy to add it to your project, even though it's not bundled with Zephyr itself. So you add an entry to your project manifest, call West Update, enable a couple of options in Kcalific, and it just works. There are some things I'd like to warn you about, though. Uh, first of all, the library uses, or I would say actually abuses uh, VLAs. So it's not easy to track the memory usage. Especially if you are trying uh, to call some factions that do many, many recursive calls underneath. And call it, uh, calculating a pseudo inverse is one example of that. Secondly, it's easy to forget about enabling FPU sharing, which saves the floating point registers, uh, floating point registers when doing a contact switch. Otherwise, if you try to do floating point math on di two different threads, then everything can get mixed up. So please be aware about that. Okay, so that's the end of the technical matters for today. Uh, to wrap up, Zephyr, obviously it's not a silver bullet for all of the burden of making embedded devices, uh, but certainly it's quite, quite a good painkiller, and it makes writing applications with it really enjoyable, even if you don't have much experience. If you ask me about my project, uh, I think I have learned a lot, uh, and also we graduated thanks to it, so definitely I can call it a success. And I hope that our efforts are not completely lost, and everyone who came here has also learned a bunch about Zephyr locating systems of ultra wideband. So, uh, thanks for joining, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> so, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, okay. Uh, so maybe. You uh, do you have do you have a mic here? Okay. Hi, uh, Johann Fischer. I am the driver of the DK Wave, uh, as a, and the author of the driver for DK Wave uh, transceiver in Zephyr OS. Um, so my question would be why uh, you started your own work and then use uh, implementation in Zephyr, which is uh, actually generic. What is missing part is uh, more uh, work and abstraction on the 15.4 subsystem because there is no real support for ultra wideband part of the 15.4 specification. So the, for, for us, like from the, from the project right starting point to what on more generic solutions would be to uh, improve 15.4 support for ultra wideband yeah, because the driver is already there and it yeah. works fine with multiple platforms thanks thanks uh, so uh, yeah like as I mentioned I well I, I know the driver is here right but uh, <laughs> there's no sample so it was you know pretty hard to get something working with it right so that's why I had to 
uh, there are samples for uh, server echo and uh, server client and server uh, socket socket client and socket servers okay. for 15.4 overlay. So I can transmit the data between two nodes. It's like with uh, usual 15.4 transceivers, if you power up with two samples, it will start to trans, uh, receive and transceive the data between like a network packets, yeah? And uh, that, uh, the confusing part is maybe what, because about net uh, packets and the timestamps inside the net packets, yeah. yeah. That's the, that, that, yeah. that was but the hardest part for me, right? How to gather the data. Get it out, yeah. The thing is to use is this, uh, like uh, uh, example from uh, time sensitive networks, I guess, support in, in ZFI, that's what they use. Because there's like, uh, 15.4 support in ZFI wasn't, wasn't designed to be like own part, yeah. Initially it was like part of IP stack, yeah. And okay. it was more abstract last time. They said that, need, that, that needs more polish and more work, yeah, to be more abstract, maybe with, yeah, some make support and yeah, ultra wide uh, band parts. And then, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> thanks about telling me that. Well, maybe when I have enough time, then I will try, you know, porting actually the application to, to that API. Like, that's something, you know, that probably will be on my list on the future. Okay. So, next question. Uh, how, how did you uh, localize the anchors? So. Uh, so basically you enter the positions of the anchors to the uh, system up front. And actually when I was uh, doing the demo, first we modeled the room with very high accuracy, then we placed the anchors in the model and from that we were able to get the XYZ coordinates. So we kind of, we kind of did, like in rever did it in the, in the reverse, I would say. So, so, so you did it manually, like not, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, as far as I recall, uh, the examples from DecaWave actually uh, like they have samples which allow you to auto position the anchors, mm -hmm. but in our case we had to enter the coordinates manually. Okay. And, sorry. <laughs> uh, and the uh, did you did you open source your uh, like like how much pain was it to simulate your your firmware uh, uh, in Kimu? So I mean the only simulated part here is the gateway uh, for the system. Like the rest yeah. of the f uh, software is running on the actual devices. And like only the gateway is uh, running on the emulator because we just we just didn't want to bring additional device for the development phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and that just worked out of the box. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the only problem, as I said on the presentation, was that well, I had some weird problem with uh, the IP connectivity on the start, mm -hmm. so I didn't you know investigate the problem. Instead, I just added a slip statement uh, and it kind of fixed the problem. And everything, all of the rest was pretty much working nicely. And I believe that's part of the. Uh, the reason for that, why it works so good, uh, is the separation of the host and control layers on Bluetooth. So yeah. these are like super interoperable, and I had absolutely no problems using the controller running on the laptop with Zephyr host, which is like, it totally blew my mind when I first turned it on. Yeah, so thank you. Great, Thanks. great project. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I have to Next question. Impressive project, yeah. So uh, it's a little unrelated to Zephyr itself, but have you done any kind of analysis on um, the, the power requirements and uh, uh, how many devices, how many tags uh, can be supported at the same time? Yeah, so as far as for the power measurements, uh, I didn't do any analysis of that, but as far as I know, ultra is actually quite power hungry, so that depends on how many uh, measurements you make. And as for, as, as for the scalability, well, TW itself, TWR itself is a method which um, isn't actually too scalable, I would say. Like, it was probably the most easy to implement, but you have a problem when you have many devices at the same time trying to infer their locations. So you probably try to implement some collision avoidance algorithm. But as far as, as far as I understand, and I recall from marketing materials of the companies which actually build these kinds of systems. They probably go with a time difference of arrival method, which actually requires you to configure uh, the time base on all of the anchors, and then you measure uh, what was the time difference of arrival of the message from the tag to those anchors. So that's the method which like, is much more scalable. The TWR obviously, like, it takes a couple of milliseconds to do the ranging. So you, you multiply it by four because you need at least four measurements. So that this will be probably like 30 milliseconds, and you can guess that probably you, 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 will, be easy, you, will, be, you will be able to run like 30 tags easily 
without any optimizations. Like if we had optimized this deeper, I believe we could get up to like 100 or maybe more. Thank you. But we didn't know very, we didn't very uh, optimize that, at least for the for that phase of the project. Thank you. Thanks. So yeah, I had, a, I had a question. If you just wanted to clarify, I'm new to Wideband, so uh, it, I got the impression you were using like you were using BLE Mesh for as a, like a communication channel, and then you were doing the ultra wideband for the distance. Yes. And can you clarify? Could you use ultra wideband for the communication as well? And yes. I mean, so uh, why didn't you? Yes, so that's totally doable, but then you you don't have you do not have any you know ready to go API to implement any kind of this system. So like ultra wideband can be used to build mesh systems, obviously. And I recall that even Deco, I believe, in some application notes, has some examples of how that system could work. But there is no you know implementation that you can use out of the box. That's why we meant, we we went with Bluetooth mesh just for you know convenience. I would say. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So, uh, is that the all questions then? Uh, okay, I see one more. Uh, could you please pass the mic? Uh, yeah, hi, thanks for that. Um, was it written in a, a sort of generic way where the tag would sort of listen or discover what devices it could actually communicate to first, sort of to get a sweep? Uh, well, so the idea is to use, we, we, we haven't implemented that yet, but the idea is to actually uh, get the data to the tag using the Bluetooth mesh. So when the device ha initially connects to the system, it will download like the list all, of all of the anchors and their addresses. And uh, from that, it, the device should be able to know uh, against which uh, anchors it should be measure uh, the distance against, right? Because it's in the neighborhood table, or? Sorry? Because it's in the neighborhood table, or will it try to actually localize against every every device that's in the mesh? Uh, no, uh, I mean it, it is doing the individual measurements uh, like one on one. There's not like a broadcasting of the messages. It measures the distance against one anchor, one and then another. Obviously, I believe there are so uh, like schemes of TWR, which actually sends out one broadcast messages and then uh, the anchors which are supposed to answer that message are in a specific order. Mm -hmm. So they uh, also in a specific order they reply back uh, with yeah. different delays to that uh, device. So that's like a one way of optimizing the system because you have n plus one messages sent instead of two n messages. But that's not uh, what we have uh, worked on. So okay, cool. we Thanks. haven't optimized that yet. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, did you experiment with range? So how far can you still measure distances and is Bluetooth giving up first or is ultra wideband uh, out of range so first? At, at least like uh, for the range purposes, I didn't like test the whole system, but to check how far UW works, at least in my configuration in the open air was like about 30 meters. So at that distance it worked like just fine. And then obviously the range of the system uh, highly depends on which channel of UWB you use because well the base frequency is from three to 10 gigahertz which like has a huge impact uh, on far, how far the system uh, works. So you have like uh, big options and obviously each one of these affects the effective range of the system, right? But I would say that it's about 30 meters at least. You can get more. Just check, I don't have anything online, but I think we're just about done now. Uh, no, we haven't any questions online, so I think okay. it's a good time to stop. So, thanks everyone uh, for coming. Thank you.